the bell icon to turn on notifications. We've made the accompanying exercise files for this tutorial available for free. Just click the link below in the video details to get these. Microsoft Project 2021 is the latest standalone version of Project available from Microsoft. It's one of the most popular tools on the market for scheduling, organizing, and managing projects of all sizes, from the most basic task lists to high-level complex projects. My name is Deborah Ashby. I'm a Microsoft trainer who's been training Project for over 15 years, and I'm going to be your host for this course. Now, let's make no mistake, Project 2021 is a complex application. There is so much functionality that it can become overwhelming, so it's important to know about those key features and how to use them effectively. Having a good understanding of Project will help you work more efficiently and deliver better project outcomes. And it's also a great thing to have on your resume. In this course, we're going to be using a fictitious training rollout plan to work through the different features and functionality that help us manage the entire project lifecycle. The files I use in the course are available to download so you can follow along with me, or you can save them for later and rewatch the videos at your own pace. At the end of each section, we're going to work through an exercise so you can really put into practice the skills that you've learned. And you can find all of these exercise files in the exercise files folder, so make sure that you've downloaded those. There'll also be questions as you go through the course so you can test your knowledge as you go. These questions really help identify where you have knowledge gaps, and then you can go back and rewatch the relevant videos. So, if you're ready to supercharge your project management knowledge, then grab yourselves a drink and spend the next few hours with me whipping a project into shape. Sometimes it can be quite complex when you're thinking about which project management solution to purchase. Because there are so many different versions of Project these days, it can be a little bit confusing. So in this lesson, let's just take a quick look at the different offerings to give you more of an idea as to which one is going to suit your needs. Now, I'm just on the Microsoft website and I'm on the Compare Project Management Solutions and Costs page. Now, notice currently we have two tabs at the top here, Cloud-based Solutions and On-Premises Solutions. And I'm currently clicked in the Cloud-based Solutions tab. So now I can see the three different project plans that are available for the cloud-based project management tools. So those would be Project for the Web, which is the latest offering, and Project Online. Project is a subscription application, so if you're thinking that it's included within your Microsoft 365 subscription, then unfortunately it's not. You do have to purchase a separate license. And you can see here those three different licenses, Project Plan 1, Project Plan 3, and Project Plan 5. Now, these have been recently renamed to bring them in line with Microsoft's Enterprise Solutions E1, E3, and E5. So Project Plan 1 is the most basic and the cheapest of the projects. And you can see here how much it is per month. Mine's showing in pounds, but this will update depending on your location. And Project Plan 1 includes Project for the Web, which is a completely cloud-based project management tool, which isn't as complex as something like Project Professional, but still gives you all of the core functionality that you need. It's also a lot easier for you to collaborate on projects using Project for the Web, and it has the advantage of being on the Power Platform, so we can really harness the power of Power Apps, Power Automate, and Power BI. And we can manage all of our projects through a web browser. So that's Project Plan 1. Project Plan 3 includes Project for the Web, so pretty much everything that we have in Project Plan 1, but it also includes Project Online, to manage more complex projects. Now, Project Plan 5 is really the big daddy of them all. This includes everything in the first two project plans, but it also allows us to do a lot of high-level project portfolio management. And if you want to take a deeper look at the different features so that you can compare and contrast, if you come onto this page and scroll down, you can see exactly what each of these plans contains. So it's definitely worth having a little look through these if you want to go for a cloud-based solution. Now, the other options that we have when it comes to project is to choose an on-premises solution. So let's jump across to that tab. 
Now, the first thing you'll notice immediately is that the prices are a lot higher. And that's because this is a one-time purchase option. It's not a subscription. So we're not paying a monthly fee to access the software. We're actually purchasing it and downloading it onto our PC. So we pay a one-time price and it's ours forever. Now, of course, the disadvantage of things like this is that if there are any updates to the software, we might have to wait for a security patch to be released. Or if we want to get new features, we might have to wait for the new version to be released before we can access them. Whereas if we're using a cloud-based solution on a subscription package, that updates automatically. Now, when it comes to the project on-premise solutions, we have Project Standard 2021 and Project Professional 2021. So Project Standard has all of the core functionality, but it doesn't really contain too many collaboration tools and some of the more advanced features. Project Professional contains absolutely everything. So if you're a PMO looking to do some high level project management, then this is going to be the application for you. And of course, it includes absolutely everything that we have in Project Standard. And Project Professional 2021 is what we're going to be using in this course. So we basically have access to all of the features. So those are all the options you have when it comes to acquiring project. So what's new in project 2021 when compared with project 2019? Well, first off, remember that I'm using Project Professional 2021. If you're using the Project Standard version, then some of these new features might not be available. So just make sure that you check the version that you're using prior to commencing this lesson. And if you want to check which version of project you're using, just click on the file tab and jump into account. So let's start out with just a generalization, something that's different. A lot of the icons in Project 2021 have a much more modern, updated look and feel. So you might notice that when you first open up the application. Now, if we go through each ribbon, so let's now go through each ribbon and I'll highlight the minor differences. And it is worth mentioning there aren't a huge amount of changes or differences between 2019 and 2021. The main overall difference is really something that's inconsequential to day-to-day -day project management. The biggest difference in Project 2021 is that Microsoft seemed to be moving towards a more cloud-based offering. But with regards to the design and the functionality, there are just a few little differences. So let's start out by jumping into File. And if we go into New, this is where we can come to create a new project. So we have a blank project and then we have our templates listed underneath that we can use. Now, one of the differences here is that we have a new template and it's the one that you can see at the top here, the Sprints project. So if we open up this template, it gives us this sprint planning board, which looks completely different to what we're used to working in in project. This is very similar to using something like board view if you're working in Microsoft Planner or project for the web. So we have a brand new template in project 2021. Now, if we go to the task ribbon and take a look at what's different here, the only thing is if we go all the way over to the right hand side of the ribbon, we have a little link to group here. Now, this button allows us to link tasks in our project to a plan that we have in Microsoft Planner. So if I click on this, it's going to open up a little pane on the right hand side and it's going to allow me to link to a specific task in a plan. Another change we can find on the report ribbon. Aside from all of these reports that we can run, we have a new report called Task Boards. So if I was to select one of these standard reports, this is basically related to the board that the tasks are assigned to. And boards are very similar to buckets, again, in an application like Microsoft Planner or Project for the Web. So just be aware that we have access to that new report. If we jump across to the Project tab, Again, in the properties group, the only change we have here is the ability to manage our sprints. So we can do things like change the name of our sprints, add more sprints, define the start and finish and the length. And if we go across to the view tab, again, we have this new view task board view, which allows us to view our tasks based on different buckets that they're stored in. Now, if we go to the help tab, not too much has changed on here. But one change we do have is notice at the top here, it says Gantt chart format. So this is where I can come to start making changes to the bars that you see in the project plan. Now, previously in project 2019, this tab was actually just called format. So there's been a little bit of a name change just there. 
And that is pretty much it when it comes to the actual differences that are going to affect what we're doing when we're working in project. As I said, a lot of the bigger changes have come in the background and the fact that Microsoft is moving to a more cloud based environment. In this first exercise, we're going to start nice and gently. So I'd like you to make sure that you have downloaded an installed project. Hopefully you're already at that stage. I then want you to make sure that you've downloaded and saved the course and exercise files. You'll find those in the relevant folders within the course. Just make sure that you have those saved off somewhere safe because we're going to be referring to those throughout this course. And then finally, make sure that you have reviewed your settings in project options so that if you're working along with me, everything matches and we don't get confused. So that is all I need you to do for this first exercise. See how you go with that. And I will see you in the next one. For the next section, you'll want to download the course exercise files. Click the link below in the video description to get these. You can also scroll through the details to find timestamps for each section in this course. If you're enjoying this training, please leave us a comment. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of how project works, we need to get ourselves familiar with the project interface. And when I say interface, I just basically mean what we're looking at on this screen. So I've opened up a project and we'll just walk through the different parts of the screen so that you're familiar with where everything lives. So if we start right at the top, you can see we have our title bar. This is where you're going to see whatever you've saved your project as. And then underneath that, we have various different ribbon tabs. And if you're used to using other Microsoft applications, like maybe Word or Excel or PowerPoint, this takes on exactly the same structure. We have our different ribbons and each ribbon contains different commands which help us execute actions in project. And all of the commands are grouped logically onto different ribbons and also into different groups. You can see right at the bottom we have the group names, so undo, view, clipboard, font, schedule, so on and so forth. Now those groups are really just there to make it a lot easier for us to find exactly the command that we're looking for at any given time. We also have a file tab at the top, which takes us into what we call the backstage area. And we'll talk about this in more detail in the next lesson. For the time being, let's just click the back arrow to take us back to our main window. Now, aside from backstage and the regular ribbons that we have when we open up project, we also have what we call contextual ribbons. And I can see one of them on the screen right now. And it's this one just here, Gantt chart format. Now what contextual ribbons are, are ribbons that only appear as and when they're needed. Now, because I'm currently in Gantt chart view, that's why I can see the Gantt chart format ribbon. And this ribbon contains all of the commands that I need to manage and format my Gantt chart. Now, if I was to click somewhere else, so let's click up here in the timeline, notice that I get a different contextual ribbon. This time I get the timeline format ribbon. So ribbons will appear and disappear depending on what we're clicked on. That's why we call them contextual. So just be aware of that point. Now, next to our ribbon tabs, we have this little tell me what you want to do box. So what I can do from up here is that I can use this little bar to search for different commands on the ribbons if I was struggling to find something, or this is where I can come to get help on something specific. So maybe I want to know a little bit more about timelines. I can type it in. And when I hover my mouse over the arrow, I have a short list of items that I can get help on. So if I select the first one, it's going to open up the help pane and then I get access to the help files, which talks me through the process of creating a timeline in project. It's also worth noting that if you quickly want to jump up to that tell me box, there is a keyboard shortcut of Alt Q that's going to position your cursor in the correct place and you can then type in whatever it is you need help on. Now, just under the ribbons, we have timeline view. Now, this is something that you don't have to have toggled on. You can simply turn this off by going to the view tab and deselecting timeline. And notice if I do that, it gets rid of it. If I click again, it brings it back.
But the timeline is a really nice way of just kind of getting an overview of everything that's going on on your project. And if you have that turned on, you're going to see it running across the top of the primary project area. And just under timeline view, this is the main area that we're going to be working with. This is the Gantt chart that we're looking at. And the Gantt chart consists of two parts, really. We have all of our tasks listed in a grid form. And then on the right hand side, we have that represented with these visual bars, which make it really nice and easy for us to see the duration of each task and how all of our tasks link together. And in general, this is going to be the view that you work in for the majority of the time. If you want to modify the size of these, then you can definitely do that. So if we hover our mouse over the borderline between the table and the actual Gantt chart, we can drag out and we can drag back in again so we can really customize the size so that it suits us. And there's quite a lot of information lurking underneath here. So you might want to widen this out quite a bit, depending on what it is that you're doing. I think I'm going to leave mine there for the time being. You can also do the same using the horizontal splitter. So once again, if I hover my mouse over the boundary, I can make more room for the timeline or I can drag the Gantt chart back up again. We have our scroll bars at the side so I can scroll up and down and see all of the tasks that I currently have in my project plan. And then finally, at the bottom, we have the status bar. Now, if you take a look over on the left hand side, you can see it's telling me that all new tasks are auto scheduled. And if I click on this, I can switch between auto scheduled and manually scheduled tasks. Now, we'll get onto that a little bit more later on, but just be aware that this acts as a toggle down in the status bar. And then all the way over on the right hand side, this is where we can come to switch between different views. So currently we're working in Gantt chart view, but we have a task usage view, a resource view, and also a resource sheet view as well. And of course, all of these we're going to discuss in more detail later in the course. The final thing we have is a little zoom slider. So if we want to zoom out or zoom in, then we can definitely do that as well. And this is fairly standard across all of the Microsoft applications. So if you've used this previously, then that's probably not too much different for you. Now, the final thing to highlight here is the quick access toolbar. Now, the quick access toolbar you'll find underneath the ribbons just above the timeline. And currently, I just have a few icons on my quick access toolbar. Now, this is a customizable toolbar which allows us to add commands that we use frequently to it so that they're quick and easy to access and we don't have to hunt through the ribbons. And we have a whole lesson dedicated to how we can customize this and set it up so it works for us. But that is pretty much the project interface. Have a little look at it. Make yourself familiar with where all the commands are and which ribbons they're located on. And I will see you in the next lesson. The ribbon tabs help us organize our commands logically into groups. And we briefly touched on this in the last lesson, but I want to explore these in a bit more detail so that you start to get familiar with where different things are located. Because in project, we have so many commands, it can sometimes be a little bit overwhelming. So if we start with the first tab just here, the task tab, this is where you're going to find a lot of the commonly used tasks. So this is where you'll go to find things like cut, copy, paste, and all of your font formatting options. It's also where we can go to manage everything related to our tasks. We can update the progress in the schedule group. We can link and unlink tasks in there as well. We can switch between auto schedule and manually schedule tasks, and we can add things like summary tasks and milestones. This is also where we can come in the properties group to see an overview of our project information. The resource tab is where we would go for everything related to resources that we've added into our project. It's where we can go to assign resources and create resource pools. And it's also where we're going to find things like our leveling options. The report tab is where we come to create reports in project. Once you have your project up and running, you're, you're probably going to want to start running some reports to analyze that data. You might want to run a cost report or a report related to the progress. We can even do things like create visual reports and dashboards from here as well. On the project tab, this is where we're going to find lots of options for managing our overall project. It's where we can change the working time, view our project information, and also do things like set baselines and move our project as well. 
The view tab is where we come to switch views. As I mentioned at the start, we're currently looking at the default view, which is the Gantt and timeline view, but we can modify how we're viewing and what we're viewing from here. This is also where we can come to do things like sort and filter our data. The help tab is pretty self-explanatory. It's where we can come if we want to get help. Notice the first button here is the help button. We have a keyboard shortcut of F1 to open those help files. And what you'll see when you click on F1 is pretty much the same as when you're using that tell me box at the top. It's going to open up a pane on the right hand side where you can go in and search for whatever it is you're looking for help on. So really nice and useful. And then of course, the final ribbon that I have here is the contextual ribbon Gantt chart format. And as I mentioned, this is contextual, so it's only appearing because I'm in Gantt chart view. If I click on timeline view, it switches to the timeline format ribbon. And these contextual ribbons contain, in this example, everything I need to change and format that timeline area running across the top. So those are going to change depending on where you're clicked. Now, the final tab that we haven't spoken about much yet is the file tab. Now, notice I refer to this sort of separately to the others, and that's because it does look different. When you click on file, it takes you into what we call the backstage area. And this is where you're going to find sort of your more admin style tasks. This is where you would come if you want to create a new project, either a blank project or maybe from a template. This is where we come if we want to open an existing project that maybe we have saved off to a specific folder or maybe even in the cloud. If we click on info, this is where we can come to see some information about this particular project that we have open. We have save and save as, and we're going to get into those a little bit more later on in this section. We can print from here, we can share our file, we can export it, and we can also close. And then towards the bottom, we have account. So this is where you can come to find out information related to your account. For example, we can see here exactly which version of project we're using. So sometimes maybe if your IT team is saying to you, what version of project are you using? This is where you can come to find out that information. Notice here it says Microsoft Project Online Desktop Client. This is where we also come to install any updates. And we can also do things like change our theme. For example, if I wanted to work with a black theme, I could do that if I preferred that. I could go with this nice dark gray, or I can stick to white or colorful, which in general is what I like to set. We can also change our office background. So if you cast your eyes up to the top right hand corner, you can see I just have this sort of doodle pattern in the background. This is where we can change that. So, so that might be something that you want to do. And finally at the bottom here, this is really important. This is our project options area. And we have lots of different pages of information. Now, options is where we come to adjust our settings and really personalize how our copy of project works for us. And we're going to be dipping in and out of here throughout the balance of this course. And in fact, in a lesson that we have coming up, we're going to jump into here and I'm going to show you some of the settings that I recommend that you change before you get started. Now, just before we leave here, I just want to go back to the open screen. Now, as I mentioned, this is where you can come to open any existing project files that you have stored off. And you can see I've got some locations here where I could select my project files from. So I use OneDrive cloud storage, so I could open up a project file that I have saved into OneDrive very easily from here. Alternatively, if I just have it saved off to my PC, I could choose the This PC option underneath Other Locations. And if I click on Browse, that's going to open up File Explorer and allow me to navigate that way if that's what you prefer. If you cast your eyes over to the right hand side, notice we have two folders at the top here, projects and folders. Now I'm currently clicked on projects and it's showing me the last projects or the most recent projects that I opened. Now this is a very new install of project 2021. So I don't have a great deal in here, but if you've been using project for a while, then this list is going to be full of your most recent files. The same thing with the folders area. This is going to show you the last folders that you saved files into. And the idea here is it just makes it really quick for you to find things that you've worked on recently and open them. And we can simply open by double clicking on the file in the list. And if you have any files that maybe you access every single day, 
you can pin those to the top of the list so that they don't move around when we start opening other files. For example, if I want to pin marketing campaign planning project, I can click on the pin icon and that's going to move it up to this pinned area just here. And that's going to stay there until I choose to unpin this item. And I can simply do that by clicking on the drawing pin once again, and it's going to remove it from that little area. Now, the final thing to mention about these ribbons running across the top is that you can minimize or collapse up the ribbon and give yourself a little bit more room on the screen. Now, the way that you do that is if you just right click your mouse anywhere on the ribbon, you can see in the contextual menu, we have an option to collapse up the ribbon. If I click on this, it's going to collapse that up. I can just see those tab headings, but I can't actually see the commands. And it just gives me a little bit more room to work with. Now, what happens when I want to actually access a command? Well, I simply click on the tab and it's going to pull down temporarily that ribbon. When I click away again, it's going to disappear. If I want to bring it back permanently, I just need to click on a tab, right click, and then uncheck collapse the ribbon. So that's more of a detailed run through of the different ribbons that we have, that backstage area and what you can find in there, and also how we can collapse up the ribbons. Something that I highly recommend that you do is customize the quick access toolbar. And I mentioned the quick access toolbar in the last lesson. It's this little toolbar that we can see running just above the timeline and underneath the ribbons. Now, currently the toolbar isn't showing too much. We have a few little icons on there. And it's worth noting that when you're looking at your copy of project, your quick access toolbar might not look exactly the same as mine, or you might not be able to see it at all. So let me show you, first of all, how you can turn the quick access toolbar off or on. Now, mine's currently on, so I'm going to turn it off, but the process is the same if you want to do the reverse. So once again, we just need to right click our mouse anywhere on the ribbon. And in the contextual menu, you can see I have hide quick access toolbar. Now, if you don't have yours displayed, that's going to say show quick access toolbar. So if I click this, notice that that toolbar now disappears. If I right click again and click show, it brings it back again. So make sure that you're showing that quick access toolbar. Now, what exactly is this quick access toolbar or QAT as we refer to it? Well, this is a customizable area where we can add commands that we use frequently to make them easy to find an action. And you can see on here, I have a few commands added already. So I can create a new project from here. I can save, I can undo, and I can redo. So how do we customize this quick access toolbar and fill it full of commands that we use all the time? Well, there are a couple of different ways that we can do this. Notice that right next to the quick access toolbar, I have a little drop down arrow. When I hover over, it says customize quick access toolbar. And that's going to open up a menu, which is going to allow me to add very quickly one of these 15 or so commands. And you can see the ones that are currently on my quick access toolbar already have a tick next to them. So new, save, undo and redo. So if I decide that I'm always print previewing my projects, I could choose print preview and it's going to add that command to that quick access toolbar. Maybe I want to add email. I could do that as well. Now, notice in here, we only have a few of the vast amount of commands that are available in project. So what if we want to add a command to the QAT that isn't in this list? Well, again, there are a couple of different ways that we can do this. Now, the easiest way to add a command that you can see on one of the ribbons is simply to right click on it. So maybe I'm always looking at the project information window. So if I go across to the project tab where we have project information, I'm going to right click and I'm going to say add to quick access toolbar. That is the quickest way to add any command that you can see on your ribbons. I'm going to right click on spelling and I'm going to add that to the quick access toolbar as well. So really nice and straightforward. And as you would imagine, if I then decide that I want to remove something from this quick access toolbar, I can right click on it and I have a remove from quick access toolbar option just here. Now it's worth noting that not every command in project is available on a ribbon. 
And some commands are available on contextual ribbons, which means we don't actually see them until they're needed. So what if I want to add one of those commands that I can't currently see on the ribbons to my quick access toolbar? Well, this is where we need to click the drop down again to go into customize and go to more commands. Now, this is basically going to jump us across to our project options. And you can see it's jumped us straight into the quick access toolbar area. Now, what you can see in here, if we start on the right hand side, is I can see a preview of my quick access toolbar and I can see all of the commands that I currently have on there. So project information and spelling were the last two that we added. On the left hand side, this is where I can see all of the commands that I can move to the quick access toolbar. Now they are grouped together. So currently I'm only looking at popular commands. If I want to see a list of all commands available in project, I need to choose all commands from that drop down. And now I have all of the commands in here. And fortunately they are organized into alphabetical order to make them a little bit easier to find. So we can then scroll through, find exactly what we want. So let's go for something like, I'm just going to go for a range. We can select it and then click the add button to move it across to the quick access toolbar. So very, very simple just to add things. Similarly, if you want to remove something from the quick access toolbar, you can select it and then click the remove button in the middle. We can also organize our commands using the up and down arrows on the right hand side. So maybe I decide that I want undo to be first in the list and redo next. And the final thing I always like to do here is I like to add some separators. Now separators are a very simple way just to add a little bit of structure into that quick access toolbar. They allow us to visually separate commands of similar type. At the top of every list in here, you're going to find separator. So I'm in all commands, but if I was in popular commands, right at the top of that list, we have a separator as well. So I'm going to add a couple of separators into here. I'm just going to rearrange them. So let's move this one down to, I think, just about there. So now when I click on OK, take a look at how that quick access toolbar has updated. So it's added the new commands and you can see that we have these faint lines. Those are the separators, which just adds a little bit of structure in. The final thing to point out here is that if you don't like or you find it difficult to identify these commands on the quick access toolbar simply by looking at the icon, we can choose to have a label next to the icon. And this is a reasonably new feature in project. Let's click the drop down. Right at the bottom here, we have show command labels. So if I click on this, you can see it adds a piece of text next to each one, making it a little bit easier to know what that icon represents. Of course, the downside is it does take up more room, so you can't have quite as many items on your QAT. I'm going to switch mine back to the icons, but that is pretty much all there is to know about the very useful feature, the quick access toolbar. If you want to work efficiently in Microsoft Project, then you're going to want to know a selection of keyboard shortcuts to help you move around your project plan quickly. And the good news is if you are already a Microsoft user, as in you are used to using applications like Excel, PowerPoint, or maybe even Word, many of the keyboard shortcuts that you already know and love in those applications are exactly the same in Project. So things like Control C to copy. Control V to paste, Control X to cut, Control S to save. All of these are exactly the same. Now, of course, there are some differences and some that are very specific to project only. And in general, what you'll find is that you'll probably have 10 to 15 keyboard shortcuts memorized and you will use them all the time. I'm a huge fan of keyboard shortcuts because I find they really do speed up the way that I work. So where can you go to see a full list of all the keyboard shortcuts available in project? Well, the easiest way is to go into the help files. So we're going to go in there from the tell me box. And I mentioned this keyboard shortcut earlier. We're going to press Alt Q, which is going to jump our cursor up to the top there. So if we type in keyboard shortcuts and hover over the arrow, I want the second one keyboard shortcuts for project. 
So this is going to open that help file. And then as we scroll down, the shortcuts are divided into different groups. So if we jump into frequently used shortcuts, we can see a big long list of all of the different shortcuts to execute specific tasks in project. And as I said, you'll notice that some of these are exactly the same. So saving a project file, control S, creating a new project file, control N. That's the same as if you wanted to create a new Word document in Word. So have a little look through these, maybe jot down a few that are going to be most useful to you. And then after a while, you'll find that you get these memorized. Now, another way to find out if a command on the ribbon has a keyboard shortcut assigned to it, because not all commands do, is to simply hover your mouse over the command. Now, notice here I'm hovered over bold on that ribbon and I can see the keyboard shortcut in brackets in that screen tip that comes up control B. If I hover over underline control U is the keyboard shortcut. If I hover over copy, control C is the keyboard shortcut. And if I hover over, for example, inspect, it's not showing me the keyboard shortcut. So does that mean that it doesn't have one? Well, not necessarily, because something else we also have, which I know a lot of people love to work with, are what we call key tips. Now we can access our key tips by pressing the Alt key on our keyboard. Now, as soon as I do that, check out what has happened to my ribbon. This is a great way to be able to navigate and select commands entirely using your keyboard. So maybe I want to switch the view. I can go across to the view ribbon by pressing W. I then jump across to that ribbon and get a whole new set of keyboard shortcuts. So let's say I want to look at task usage. I'm going to press K. That's going to drop down the menu. I want the first one, so I need to select K again, and now it's switching me across to that particular view. Take a look at the bottom. I can see my task usage pane, and I did that using entirely keyboard shortcuts. So that Alt key is really useful. So if you recall, I mentioned that some of these commands, when you hover over them, don't have a keyboard shortcut showing. But if we press the Alt key and make sure that we're on the task tab, press H. Notice that inspect actually does. I could use NS and that is effectively a shortcut for this inspect command. And if you want to turn these key tips off, simply press the Alt key again to get rid of them. When we're working in project, we have lots of different built in views that we can display in different panes. And the initial view or the default view that will load up when you first start using project is called Gantt with timeline. And you can see that reflected in the current project. At the top, we have this timeline view giving us an overview. And then underneath, we have the Gantt chart, which shows us all of our individual tasks, our task information, and then a visual representation of those tasks. Now, if we jump up to the view tab up here, we have a split view group. So this is where I can control whether or not I see that timeline view at the top. So if I decide that I'm not interested in this at this stage, I can simply deselect timeline and that's going to disappear. Put the check back and it brings it back again. Something else I can do from here is I can turn on the details view. And what this is going to do is it's going to split the screen and it's going to add task form view at the bottom. And this task form basically gives me more information about whatever task I'm currently clicked on in my project plan. So if I was to select this second task just here, I can see a little bit more information about this specific task. So currently I don't have any resources assigned to this task. So that is why this area is blank, but I can see the duration is two days. It's effort driven. I can see the start and finish dates. I can see that it's fixed units and I can also see a list of any predecessors down here as well. So that details pane can be pretty useful for viewing more detailed information. Now I'm going to turn this off and I'm going to switch my timeline back on again. Now let's jump back to the task tab because you can see that we have a view group just here. Now, if I click the drop down, this is where we can choose what we're displaying in our primary window. So currently you can see that I'm displaying the Gantt chart, but I've also got a big long list of some of the most popular views that I might want to switch to. For example, I could switch across to the task usage view, and I'm now seeing that in the primary window as opposed to the Gantt chart. 
Now notice at the side here we have task usage and timeline. Now the one that's highlighted in green is basically where you're currently clicked. So for me that is task usage. If I was to click up in the timeline that title is going to turn to green. So just be aware that you can very simply switch between your views from this Gantt chart drop down. The difference between this and jumping across to the view tab is on the view tab we just have a bit more detail about the different views that we can select and it's split down into views related to tasks and views related to resources. Now the final way that we can switch views in project is by using the status bar and again this is very similar to other Microsoft applications. If you cast your eyes down to the bottom right hand corner you can see that we have our different views down here. So I can switch into Gantt chart view which is basically what I'm currently on. I can switch across to task usage view which is what we were just looking at. I can go to team planner which is a slightly different way of viewing my project. And then I also have a resource sheet. So if I have any resources, I'm going to be able to see them in there. And then finally, I have a blank report view as well. So as always with Microsoft, there are numerous different ways of switching views. We're going to be working predominantly in the default view, which is Gantt chart and timeline. So as you leave this lesson, ensure that your project is set up in this way. Another piece of terminology that you need to get used to when you're working in project is the concept of tables. And a table is a little bit like a spreadsheet in Excel. For example, currently I have the entry table loaded up on the screen. And this is just what you can see over here. A table in general is made up of columns and also rows. So in this particular entry table, you can see the columns that we have a task mode, task name, duration. And then if I was to drag this out, we have a lot more lurking underneath there. And then we have rows that contain our task information. And this has the look and feel, as I said, of an Excel spreadsheet. Now the entry table is the main table that you're going to use to enter information about each task. But there are other tables that we can load up in order to see other pieces of information and also edit them directly from the table as well. So if we jump up to the view tab at the top in the data group, we have a tables drop down just here. And you can see that currently the entry table is selected. That's the one we're currently looking at. But I have other tables that I can select depending on what I'm interested in seeing at any given time. So maybe I want to load up the summary table. I can simply select it and it gives me an overview of the main touch points of this particular project. Or maybe I'm interested in the costs that are assigned to this project. I could load up the costs table. Now we don't have any costs in this project as yet, but we can see our fixed costs, our total costs, our baseline, the variance, all things like that. Let's go back up to tables because we also have a more tables option right at the bottom. And this is going to open up this little window, which is going to show us all of the tables that we can load up into our primary window. So if you can't find what you're looking for in that tables drop down, jump into more tables and you should be able to find it in here. So maybe I'm interested in looking at the work table. Let's apply. And this is going to show me information about the work hours, the baseline work hours, if I've set that, the variance, the actual, so on and so forth. Now, another way that you can quickly switch between tables is to hover your mouse over this little square in the corner. So just above where we have row zero and to the left of where it says task name, if we right click in this little area, this is a quick way of switching between the most popular types of tables. So I'm going to switch back to entry. But that's pretty much all you need to know about tables at this stage. Just know that there are lots of different tables that you can load up in order to view different types of information. In exercise two, we're going to practice some of the skills that we've learned so far in this section. So the first thing I'd like you to do is just open up project and then open a new blank project. I'd like you to review the ribbons and familiarize yourself with where the commands are located on each ribbon. I'd then like you to practice moving between ribbons and selecting commands using keyboard shortcuts. Once you feel comfortable with all that, let's add some commands to our quick access toolbar. 
so I don't mind which ones you add. I've just given you some examples here of adding the Format Painter, the 100% Complete button and Copy. And finally, I just like you to have a little play around and switch between views and tables so that when we do that throughout the course, you know exactly where you need to go. So a few things to do there. If you'd like to see my answer, then please keep watching. So the first thing I asked you to do in this exercise is open a new blank project. So I'm back at the start screen. I'm in the new section. We have blank project at the top, double click to select. The next thing I asked you to do was just familiarize yourself with the different ribbons. So take a good look through some of these ribbons and review some of the commands that we have on these ribbons. Remember, if we hover our mouse over any of these, we get that little screen tip pop up, which gives us more of an idea as to what this does. So I just wanted you to sort of have a little look through, start to get familiar with the layout of project. The next thing I asked you to do was to practice navigating quickly and opening up commands using keyboard shortcuts. So remember, we can press our Alt key, which pulls up those little letters. So for example, I could go to the View tab by pressing W. I could go to the Gantt chart by pressing G, and then I could switch to the Tracking Gantt by pressing N. So make sure you're familiar with those Alt key shortcuts. The next thing I asked you to do was to practice adding some commands to the Quick Access Toolbar. Now, I already have quite a few on here, and I didn't really mind which commands you added, but I did give you some examples. And one of those was the Format Painter, so we can simply find it here in the Clipboard group. Right-click, Add to Quick Access Toolbar. Another one was the 100% Complete button, which is just here in the Schedule group. Right-click, Add to Quick Access Toolbar. And the final thing I asked you to practice was simply switching between different views and tables. So on the task ribbon, we can click the drop down underneath Gantt chart and we can switch to different views from here. So I can switch to the resource sheet. I can switch to resource usage, so on and so forth. And if I want to switch between tables, I can click on the view tab, click the tables drop down. The default is the entry table, but I can switch to any of these. So I can go to the work table, the summary table, so on and so forth. So just make sure you're familiar with all of these different controls. There's lots of options and settings that we can change in Microsoft Project to get our copy of Project working in a way that best suits us. And really, the options that you set are very much personal preference, but there are a few that I would recommend that you either toggle on or toggle off before you get going. So let's run through those and I'll show you my recommendations. Now to get to your project options, we need to jump up to the file tab, which is gonna take us into that backstage area. And we're going straight down to the bottom. Let's open up options. Now project options is a huge area. We have so many different things that we can change in here. And you can see we have these different categories running down the left-hand side. So let's be logical and start at the top with the general tab. I'm just gonna draw your attention to some that I'd like you to check and possibly think about changing. Now notice here in the second section, we have project view, and it's telling me that the default view here is Gantt with timeline. And that's exactly what you can see behind here. We have the timeline at the top and the Gantt chart underneath. And in general, this is the view that I would recommend you start working with. There are other options in here, but if you have it set to something else, make sure that at least for the duration of this course, you have it set to Gantt with timeline. We can also choose add date format from here as well. Now, this will differ depending on where you are in the world. As you can probably tell, I'm in the UK and the UK has a different date format to somewhere like the US. Now, I have my copy of project set to US date format and you can see all of those listed down here. And in general, I like my dates to show in project in a very concise way. So instead of this date format, I'm actually going to change mine to something a little bit more concise. I'm going to put it to that. Let's now jump across to the schedule page and take a look at what we have in here. Now at the top here where we have calendar options for this project, this is basically the time scale that our project is going to take on. So the week starts on Monday, the fiscal year starts in January and a working day is essentially 8 till 5 p.m., 8 hours per day, 40 hours per week and 20 days per month. Now we're going to talk a lot more about calendars a bit later on but this is your standard calendar that Project uses by default. 
Of course, we can set up our own calendars and modify this default calendar so that it more accurately reflects the working hours of our company because not everybody works Monday to Friday, 8 till 5 p.m. For the time being, we're going to leave these default calendar settings alone. If we scroll down to scheduling options for this project, you can see where it says new tasks created are auto scheduled. And there are two options in here. You can have manually scheduled tasks and auto scheduled tasks. So I'd like you to make sure that you have this set to auto schedule. What that means is that project will use its own scheduling engine to calculate when the task should occur. And in general, it's a lot less work for you than manually scheduling your tasks. Now, a little bit further down, we have this little checkbox. New tasks are effort driven. Now, I'm going to put a check in this box because what this means is that the total work or effort remains the same when you modify resource assignments. For example, if we assign two people to a task, that task duration decreases because the work is split between two people. And usually that's what you want it to do. So make sure you have a little tick in that box. And I also want you to make sure that where it says auto link inserted or move tasks, make sure that you don't have a tick in this box. Because in my experience, having this ticked can end up pretty messy. So make sure you untick that. Now let's jump across to the save page and check out our save options. Now, right at the top here, this is where we can specify where our project files are saved. So I'm going to change the location. Let's go to browse and I want mine saved in my course files folder. Let's click on OK. And the good thing about this is that every time I now go to save a project file, it's automatically going to jump me straight to this folder because it's the default file location. Another thing you might want to check here is auto save. So how often would you like your project file to auto save? Now, currently I have mine set to five minutes and that's a little bit too short. So I think I'm going to change this to 20 minutes and I want it to save the active project only. Now, another setting that I like to have turned on is prompt before saving. And what that means is that every 20 minutes, I'm going to get a prompt pop up on my screen asking me if I'd like to save my project file. Now, the reason why I like to have a prompt is that sometimes if I'm just messing around with a project file, if I'm not prompted to save, it means it's just going to save it automatically. And it might be that I'm doing something that I don't particularly want to save to the file. So I like to have a little prompt and I can choose myself if I want to save or if I don't. Again, this is very much personal preference, but now I've set it to 20 minutes, you might see it pop up occasionally as we're working through this course. Let's jump across to the advanced page. And in this general section, I'm also going to turn on this option prompt for project info for new projects. So when we create a new project, it's automatically going to open up the project information window so that I can enter in some useful information about my project. And this is something in general that I would do at the start anyway, when I create a new project. So I might as well have it automatically prompt me to do that. So let's put a tick in there. And finally, let's jump across to the trust center and we're going to go into our trust center settings. Now I'm going to choose legacy formats just here because this allows me to define how project deals with files that have been created in older versions of project. Because what you might find is that if you are trying to open a file that was created in a much older version of project, project professional simply will not open it. And sometimes you're not really sure why. So I'm going to say prompt when loading files with legacy or non default file format. So that I get a message letting me know that this file was created in an older version. Let's click on OK and OK again to save those settings. So those are some of the settings that I recommend you change before you start working with project. In this lesson, we're going to explore the basics of creating, saving and closing a project file. And up until this point, we've been working with just a very basic file that I've created from a template in project. Now, the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to close this file down. So a couple of points about closing project files. There are a few different ways that you can do this. We can jump across to the file tab and we have a close option in here. We could also use the keyboard shortcut control W. Notice that it's prompting me to save my changes. So I'm going to say, yes, I do want to save those changes 
and it's now closed down that file. A mistake that a lot of people often make is they immediately go up to the top right hand corner of the screen and click on the cross in the corner. Now the difference here is that if you click on that cross it's going to close down all of project. So you're going to need to restart the application again in order to open another file. So if you just want to close down the file but leave project open, go to file and close or use the keyboard shortcut control W. So now we've closed that file, it's jumped us directly to the backstage area and to the new section. So this is where we can come to create a new project file. And you can see we have lots and lots of different templates. Sometimes it's quite good to start from a template because it means you're not having to start completely from scratch. And you can see that we have lots of templates in here organized by category that we can have a little search through. So maybe I just want a simple project plan. I could select this template from here, click on create, and it's going to load that up into the main window. And these are great because we can just go in and edit the tasks, but we already have the bare bones of a project plan in place. So they're a great starting block if you're new to project, and even if you're not new to project, they can be invaluable. Now we're not going to work from a template in this case, so control W to close down, and this time I'm not going to save the changes. Because what we want to do is we want to create a blank project. So you can see the first option we have here, the first thumbnail is blank project, or we can use the keyboard shortcut control N, which is also going to create us a new blank project. Now notice what's happening here. If you remember, one of the options that we set in the last lesson was that as soon as we create a new project, it's going to pop open the project information window. And that's exactly what it's doing just here. So now I can define the start date of my project, the calendar I want to use, where I want to start scheduling from, all of that helpful stuff. So I'm going to set my project start date to quite a way in the future. So let's do it for the 1st of March next year. Now, when you schedule a project start date, that's basically where any tasks you add are going to start from. But also if you add tasks and you don't assign a date to them, which is something which happens frequently in projects. Sometimes you're not really sure when exactly a task is going to start right at the beginning of the project. If you add a task with no start date, it's going to give it the default of whatever we have for the start date of the project. So in this case, March the 1st, 2023. Now notice that the finish date is grayed out. And that's because project calculates the finish date for us automatically based on the tasks in our schedule. So the finish date is constantly moving depending on the duration of each task. That's why we can't edit it from here. Another thing to note is that the calendar that this project is going to use is the standard calendar. And I briefly mentioned this again in the last lesson. The standard calendar or the default calendar in project is Monday to Friday, 8 to 5 p.m. with an hour for lunch. Now, there are a couple of other calendars in here. There's a 24 hour calendar. And there's also a night shift calendar. But for now, we're going to keep this on the standard calendar. So that's all the information I want to add about this project at this stage. Let's click on OK. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to save this project. If you take a look up in the title bar, you'll see that before you save it for the first time, it's going to be given the very generic name of project one, project two, project three, so on and so forth. So let's save again. We can go into file or we can press control S and it's going to jump us across to the save as section. Now, if this is the first time that you're saving a file, it doesn't matter if you choose save or save as it's going to take you to save as because we need to give it a name. Now I'm going to go straight down to browse and notice what happens. Again, this is another setting that we changed. It takes me directly to my default project file location, which for me was the course files folder. So I'm just going to give this a name, my first project and click on save. Notice that the name has now changed up in the title bar. So now that we've saved this for the first time, as we work through, we can now just save normally. So when we press control S, it's just going to save all the changes that we've made. Now I'm quickly going to close this file. Again, I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut control W and let's just briefly take a look at how we can reopen files. Let's go to the open page. And if you cast your eyes over to the right hand side of the screen, notice that the file that we last accessed is at the top of the list. And I'm going to click on the drawing pin to pin that to the top. So all I really need to do here is double click to reopen. And if we control W to close down again, the other way that I could open the file is to go to browse 
And it's going to jump me back to that folder where I have all of my files saved. And I can simply select it, click on open, and it's going to open the file. So really simple and straightforward to create new project files, save them and close and open a project. I've mentioned calendars a few times already in this course. So let's delve into this subject in a little bit more detail and I'll show you how you can set up your project calendar. Now, as I've mentioned, calendars in project define the working and non-working time for your project. And the default calendar in project is Monday to Friday, 8 to 5 p.m. with one hour for lunch. Now, not everybody works in this way. For example, some people might work part time, others might work at night. Some might have certain days of the week off. So we have the ability to create additional calendars in project. So let's go up to the project tab. And in the properties group, we want to go to change working time. This is where we can come to take a look at our different calendars and define the working hours for that calendar. It's also where we can create new calendars from as well. Now notice at the top, we have loaded up our standard project calendar. This is the default. We have a little legend which tells us what this shading means in this calendar. So you can see here, anything that's white is working time. So that's Monday to Friday. Anything that's shaded in gray is non-working time. So in this calendar, that is Saturday and Sunday. And that's all we have in this particular standard calendar. Notice that if I click on a day in the calendar, it shows me over on the right hand side that this particular day that I'm clicked on is a working day. And these are the hours. So 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. We then have a one hour break for lunch. And then the afternoon is 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. And then underneath we have a little exceptions table and a work weeks table. Now, if we go back up to the top and click the drop down, notice we have two other calendars in here. So let's take a look at the night shift calendar. So this is defined by different working times. So you can see here every day is a working day apart from Sunday. And if I click on one of the working days, we can see the working times for this particular night shift calendar. So 12 a.m. to 3 a.m., then 4 a.m. to 8 a.m., 11 p.m. to 12 a.m. Now, if we take a look at the work weeks tab underneath, this tab basically represents the days and times when people work. Now, because this says default in here, the default calendar applies to all dates. So let's switch back to our standard project calendar, because what we're going to do here is we're going to make some modifications. So I'm going to make sure that I'm clicked on work weeks where we have default and let's click on details. Now I've got Sunday selected currently and Sunday is a non-working day in this standard calendar. But let's go to Monday. You can see in here, it's showing us the times that apply for this working day. Now, maybe I decide that Monday to Friday, the working day at my organization doesn't start until 9 a.m. So the morning is basically 9 a.m. to 12. We then have an hour for lunch and then the afternoon is 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. instead. So I'm going to change these working times. Now, a simple way to do this is I can select all of the days that I want to change the times for simply by holding down my mouse button and dragging down. So I've got Monday to Friday selected. I'm going to say set days to these specific working times, which allows me to edit these fields. So I can simply come in here and I'm going to make the change. So let's say we want this to be 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. and click on OK. And you can now see that that's been reflected up here where it says working times for October the 5th, 9 a.m. to 12, 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. And you'll find that that is the same for all of the working days. So very simple and straightforward to modify the standard calendar. Now, it might be that some weeks we have different working hours. So, for example, that kind of middle week between Christmas and New Year, where a lot of people still work, the company might decide that we have reduced hours because it's Christmas. So if we want to add in a schedule that accommodates that, we can simply add in another work week in this little area at the bottom. So I could give it a name, let's say, I'm just going to call it Christmas week. I can choose when that's going to start. So let's move across to December and it's going to be, let's say this week just here, it starts on the 26th and ends on the 30th. 
I can then go into details and I can set up the hours for that particular week. So again, it's Monday to Friday. I'm going to set the working hours and maybe everyone's doing a half day. So let's say 12 to 6 p.m. And I can just delete out what we have here. Click on OK and check out the calendar above. It's now updated to reflect that change. I notice in the calendar, these are now highlighted in yellow. And if we look at the legend, it's telling me that this is a non-default work week because it's a little bit of an anomaly. And of course, from here, we can also create additional calendars. So maybe I want to create a calendar for all the members of staff who work part time. We have a create new calendar button in the top right hand corner. Let's click it. And I'm going to call this part time calendar. And in general, I like to base the part time calendar off of the standard calendar and simply modify it. So I'm going to say make a copy of standard. Let's click on OK. I want to save the changes I've made to the standard calendar. And now I'm in the part time calendar. So I can now go through and define the working times. So let's go into details. Again, I'm going to say that part time workers, they work Monday, Wednesday and Friday and they do 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And let's get rid of that underneath. Click on OK. And now I have my part time calendar, which I can select from the four calendar drop down at the top. Using project calendars, we can define exceptions for regular work weeks, such as public holidays. So in this lesson, I'm going to show you how you can set those up. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to jump across to the project tab and we're going to go back into change working time. And we're going to add our exceptions to the standard project calendar. So let's make sure that we've got that selected at the top there, which we have. And at the bottom, we want to make sure we're clicked on the exceptions tab. Now, exceptions are primarily for non working time. For example, I might want to set up an exception for the first bank holiday in May next year. Now, for those of you outside of the UK, a bank holiday is basically just a public holiday. And for us, we have a bank holiday on the 1st of May. It's our spring bank holiday. So I'm going to set up an exception in this calendar because it's non working time. So let's first type in the name. I'm going to double click so I can edit this cell and I'm going to say spring bank holiday. Now, when I press the tab key, it puts in some default start and finish dates, but we're going to jump straight in here and we're going to change this. So the spring bank holiday occurs on the 1st of May every year. So let's select that. And it's just one day. So you can see the finish time has automatically updated to reflect a one day holiday. Maybe I want to add in another exception. So this time we're going to say that the office is being renovated. So none of us are working. Now that probably wouldn't happen in a real world scenario. We'd probably be asked to work from home. But just for this example, let's add in five days of non working time for office renovations. And this is going to occur in the summer. So let's go and say that this is going to start on the 12th of June and it's going to end on the 16th of June. So we have a five day duration. Now, because this is non working time, I don't really need to jump into details and specify anything else other than the name and the start and finish dates. And you can see that when I click on exception number two, office renovations at the top here, it says June the 12th, 2023 is non working. And if we now take a look in the little calendar preview for June just above, you can see that those have been sh shaded out accordingly in the calendar. And if we look at the legend, it's telling me that this relates to exception days for this calendar. So, so far, everything is working correctly. Now, another thing you can add in are recurring exceptions. For example, maybe our team has a monthly all day meeting. Now, technically, these might be considered as working days, but we're going to block them out in our calendar as non working days. And this is a meeting that occurs every month. So we want to make sure that we set this exception to recur monthly. So let's type in the name. You're going to say monthly meeting. Now for this, I don't necessarily need to specify the start and finish dates just here. If we jump into details to open up this pane, this is where we can set our recurrence pattern. And one thing to note here is that when you're adding in this type of recurring exception, all of the recurrences need to be the same. So we're going to set this to non working time. 
and then we're going to choose our recurrence pattern. So this is a monthly meeting and I'm going to say that this meeting occurs on the first Monday of every month. And then we need to choose the range of recurrence. So when is the first meeting going to be? When's it going to start? So I'm going to say that this first meeting is going to be towards the start of the project. So our project begins on the 1st of March. So let's say that the first meeting is going to be the Monday after the 6th of March. And then we can choose a specific date that we want this to end by, or we can choose to end after a specific number of occurrences. So I'm going to schedule this for an entire year. So I'm going to say end after 12 occurrences because it's a monthly meeting. Let's click on OK. And now we should see this also shaded out in our calendar as an exception day. So we're on June 2023, but remember I scheduled it for all of next year. And the first Monday of the month, the 5th of June, is in fact shaded out. If we go to May, you can see, yes, it's there as well, so on and so forth. And now you can also see in the exceptions table at the bottom, the start and finish dates have now updated to reflect the information that we've added into details. Let's click on OK. And we now have those exceptions added to our standard calendar. In order for everything to work correctly in project, there's some information that project needs to know. For example, project needs to know how many work hours there are in a day and a week, along with how many days there are in a month so that it can convert durations between time units. It also needs to know the default start and finish times for tasks when they don't have dependencies to calculate them. So let's just confirm what our calendar hours actually are, first of all. So we're going to go up to the project tab and we're going to go into change working time. Now we're in the standard project calendar and you can see in the preview window underneath, it's currently got today's date highlighted, October the 4th, 2022. And then we have our working times defined 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. We have a one hour break for lunch and then we work 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. So this works out to an eight hour day, which is 40 hours a week. So these are the working times that we've defined for our standard project calendar. And if you recall, we did make a slight amendment to these earlier on in this course. So now that we have just reviewed our actual working times, let's click on OK and we're going to jump into project options. So let's go up to the file tab all the way down into options and we're going to go to the schedule tab. Now we did briefly look in here a bit earlier on because at the top here, this is where we can define our calendar options for this project. So what we're basically trying to do here is we want to make sure that our calendar options in here match our actual project calendar. Now notice here, default start time is 8 a.m. Now note at the top here, default start time and default end time are currently set to 8 till 5. So we need to change this because our project calendar is 9 to 6. So we're going to reselect 9 a.m. and we're going to finish at, where are we, all the way down here, 6 p.m. And this still works out at a standard 8 hours per day, 40 hours per week and 20 days per month. If you're wondering how it calculates this 20 days per month, Project basically says there's roughly four weeks in a month and there are five working days per week. So four times five is effectively 20 days per month. Now, the final thing you want to check in here is right at the top where it says calendar options for this project. And we have the project that we've got open right now listed. Now, if we click the drop down, we want to make sure we change this to all new projects, because if we leave it on just the project that we have open, these timings are only going to be used for that particular project. And I want to use these timings for all new projects that I create. So let's make sure we select all new projects and click on OK. So now our project options are synchronized with what we have defined in our project calendar. In this exercise, we're going to practice some of the skills that we've learned in this section of the course. So I'd like you first to open the file newproductlaunch.mpp from the exercise files folder. 
Once you've got that file open, I'd like you to go in and change the working time of the standard calendar to 9am to 1pm and 2pm to 6pm. I'd then like you to add another calendar, a part-time calendar, for staff that work Monday to Friday, 9am to 1pm. I'd like you to sync the project calendar options with the project calendar. And once you've done all of that, I'd like you to close the project file. So a few different things to do there. If you'd like to see my answer, then please keep watching. So the first part of this task was to open the file newproductlaunch.mpp from the exercise files folder. So this is that file. You can see it's already populated with tasks, duration, start and finish dates. Now the next part of the task was to change the working time. So for this, we need to go to the project tab and in the properties group, change working time. Now I asked you to change the working time for the calendar, standard project calendar, which is the one that we currently have selected. And if I click on one of the working days, so Monday to Friday, you can see that the current working times are 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. and 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. So let's go across to Work Weeks and click on the Details button. And from here, we can define our working times. So I'm going to select Monday to Friday, and we do that by holding down the Shift key. And I'm going to say Set Days to these specific times. And then we're going to modify this 9 a.m. to 1 p.m and 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. and click on OK. So now all of our working days should be set to those times. I then asked you to create a new calendar for part-time workers. So let's click on Create New Calendar. I'm going to call this Half Time and I'm going to make a copy of the standard calendar to do this. I'm going to say yes, I want to save changes to the standard calendar and now I can define my working hours. So once again, I'm going to select a working day. Let's click on the details button. But this time we're going to select Monday to Friday. We're going to set to these specific working times. But the part time people only work nine to one. So let's add that in and we can delete out the other times. Click on OK. And now we can switch between these two calendars. We have our standard project calendar with our new times, and then we have our half-time calendar, where we have 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. The next thing I asked you to do was to synchronize your times with the actual project options calendar. So for this, we can jump straight into options by clicking the options button at the bottom. We're going to say that our week starts on a Monday, and I want to define my default start and end times. So we want these to match the times we've just set, so 9 a.m. and the default end time is 6 p.m and click on OK. Let's click OK again. I'm going to give my file a quick save and then we're going to close. It's time now to talk about something that is really important in project and that is the difference between automatic and manually scheduled tasks. Now before we get into the details, we need to make a quick change in project options. And as I've just been talking, you can see the project has popped up a prompt for me to save this project. If you recall in a previous lesson, I also set this in options as well. So I'm going to say yes, I do want to save. And let's jump into our project options. Now, if we go to the schedule page, I want to draw your attention to this little section down here, scheduling options for this project. Now notice it says any new tasks that are created are going to be manually scheduled. And this applies to this project only. So just this file that I have open. And if you take a look just behind this window in the status bar, you can see right at the bottom, it says new tasks manually scheduled. Now I want to change this so that every task I schedule is auto scheduled across all of the projects that I create. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to change this because what I want to happen here is that for all new projects, I want them to be auto scheduled by default. So I'm going to change it in my options, click on OK, and it's not going to switch this project to automatically schedule new tasks by default. I need to manually change that at the bottom. So where we have new tasks manually scheduled, I'm going to click just here and make sure that I have auto scheduled selected. Going forward, if I create new projects, it's going to default to auto scheduled. Now, what is the difference between manually scheduled tasks and auto scheduled tasks? 
Well, let's start out with auto-scheduled tasks first of all. Auto-scheduled tasks mean that project is automatically going to calculate task dates and durations, which is extremely helpful, particularly for large complex projects. With manually scheduled tasks, we're in control of the task dates and durations. So let's take a deeper dive into this because it's a really important concept to get your head around. So let's start with auto scheduled. If we take a look at the project plan that I have open, notice that the second column here is called task mode. So this is where we have our indicator as to whether a particular task is manually or automatically scheduled. And you can see here that for all of these tasks in this project plan, I have this icon. And this icon tells me that this particular task is automatically scheduled. That is the task mode. So let's pick a task in this list. I'm going to go for task number 12 just here. You can see that the duration of this task is three days. The start date is October the 7th and the finish date is October the 11th. So when I added this task in and I set the duration to three days and I also set the start date, Project automatically calculated what that finish date is going to be based on the duration and the start date. And of course, it's going to take into account things like weekends and non-working days. So project effectively defines for me when this task is going to finish. Now, the benefits of automatically scheduled tasks really present themselves when we're looking at linked tasks. So for example, we're still looking at task 12. And if we take a look at the bars on the right hand side, we can see this blue bar here represents the length of this particular task. But notice at the end, we have an arrow because it's linked to task number 13. So task number 12 needs to finish before task number 13 can begin. So what happens if I was to change the duration of one of these tasks? So I'm going to go to task number 12. And instead of three days, let's change this to seven days. Now, notice what happens. The start and finish times update. And again, if we take a look at the bar, that's also updated. It's now longer than it was. And task number 13, which relies on task number 12 completing, has also had its start and finish dates adjusted because of the change that we've made. So this is why automatically scheduling tasks is my preferred option, because it means that I don't then have to go in and start moving around task number 13 to reflect the new start and finish times. Now, manually scheduled tasks are basically do-it-yourself scheduling. We set the dates and the durations. So just to show you how this works, let's add a brand new task into our schedule. So I'm going to click task number 15, and I'm going to insert a new task above this task. Now, there are a few different ways you can insert tasks. I'm going to right click, and then from the contextual menu, I'm going to choose insert task. So now we have this new task up here. Notice that it's by default on the same indentation level as the ones above. And we're going to talk more about that in a later lesson. And it's automatically inserted it as an automatically scheduled task. Take a look at the icon in the task mode column. Now I'm going to change this to a manually scheduled task. So to change individual tasks, we don't want to change them all. We can click in the task mode, click the drop down and switch it from auto to manually scheduled. Now notice the different icon that we get just there. We get this little drawing pin or push pin icon. So that is how you can tell which tasks are manually scheduled and which ones are automatically scheduled. Also notice in the duration, we have one day question mark. And that's because we haven't defined start and finish dates for this task as yet. So project doesn't really know. So it's put in the default of one day and it's presenting a question mark because there's unknown information. So let's rename this task. I'm going to call this, I'm going to say finalize market research results, press the tab key, and I'm going to set a duration. So I'm going to set this to two days. Now notice the start date just here. It's showing as September the 30th, 2022. And that is in fact the start date of this project. So when we don't define a start date for a task, the default is to start based on that project start date. Now also notice what's going on with the bar over here. Notice that the bar is showing in this teal color. Now maybe at this stage, I'm not sure about the start date for this particular task. So what I could do in here is add in some placeholder text as opposed to having start and finish dates. 
So in the finish field, I'm going to click and I'm going to say confirm with team. Now notice that it's been shaded out. The bar is now also a lot shorter because we don't have a finish date. We only have a start date. And check out what's happened to the icon in the task mode column. We now have a question mark in there because the finish date is effectively unknown at this stage. And this is a really good reminder for me when I'm looking through my project plan, I can see these highlighted areas, these placeholders, so that I know that I have some action to take. I need to confirm the market research results with the manager and together we can work out how long this task might possibly take. Once we have that information, we can just go back into the schedule and add it in. So I'm going to say that it's been confirmed with the manager that this task needs to start on October the 20th. 2022. The duration is two days, so the finish date is going to be December the 21st. Notice the bar now has these dark green caps on either end, so that just means that we have a defined start and finish date for this manually scheduled task. Also notice that the question mark has disappeared from the push pin icon because we've entered in the duration, the start and the finish date. So now that we've established the difference between auto scheduled and manually scheduled tasks, let's create an auto scheduled task so you can see how this works. So to add a task into the entry table, it's a simple case of clicking in the first row in the task name column and typing the task name. So my first task is conduct course research. If I press the tab key, it's going to take me across to the duration field and notice again by default, it's put in start and finish dates based off of the start date of this project. Also notice in the task mode column, this is an automatically scheduled task. So all we need to do here is basically fill in the duration and project is going to take care of everything else. So let's say that course research is going to take me 10 days. Now I can use these little up and down arrows to scroll through. The number of days. Alternatively, I can click in the cell and I can simply type in 10. Now the default is day, so I don't need to specify anything other than 10. On a side note, if you wanted to maybe use weeks instead, what you could do here is type in, let's say one W and that's going to give you one week. Now I'm going to switch this back to 10 days. Now, if I just put in 10, because I just changed it to weeks, it's going to give me 10 weeks instead. So now I do need to add something in other than 10. I need to add D after it. So project knows it's days and not weeks. And now based off of this duration and my start date, project has automatically calculated what that finish date is going to be for this specific task. And we can see the bar updated in our timeline on the right hand side. So really nice and straightforward. Let's add in another task. And we're going to say that this task is going to take three days. Now, once again, check out the bar. Because I haven't specified a start date, it's starting at the same time as conduct course research, which is based off the start date of the entire project. Now, maybe I can't draft the course outline until I've conducted the course research. So I really want this task to begin when the one before it finishes. So I'm going to change the start date just here to the, let's say the 16th of March. Now check this out. I'm getting the planning wizard pop up. Now the planning wizard is an option that you can turn off or on, but by default, this is turned on. So it's telling me you entered a start date for draft course outline that is close to the finish date of conduct course research. So it's asking me if I'd like to link these so that draft course outline will always follow conduct course research. Or do I just want to move the start date of this task without adding a link to the previous task? Now, in this case, I do want to link these together because conduct course research is effectively a predecessor of, of draft course outline. Now we are kind of getting a bit ahead of ourselves here because we haven't really discussed predecessors. But for the time being, just to really illustrate the benefits of auto scheduling tasks, I'm going to say that I want to link them. Now, as soon as I click on OK, check out what happens to task number two. It's now moved to its new start date and it's linked to the previous task. 
So what we're basically saying here is that task number one, conduct course research, needs to end before I can draft the course outline. Also notice in the entry table just here, we have a predecessors column and we have a number one next to task number two. So this is telling me that task number one is a predecessor of task number two. So basically, when you automatically schedule tasks, and particularly when you're linking them together, the finish date of this first task really controls the other task. So now we understand how an automatically scheduled task works, let's turn our attention to manually scheduled tasks. And to really illustrate the difference, I'm going to add one more automatically scheduled task into the schedule. So let's click in task name and add a third task. So send outline to training manager for review is task number three. Once again, notice the duration is set to one day with a question mark. So that means currently this is estimated. The start and finish dates are set to the start date of the project simply because we haven't linked this task to any predecessors. So for example, I kind of want all of these tasks to start after each other. So I can't send the outline to the training manager for review until I've drafted the course outline. So effectively, task number two is a predecessor of task number three. So what I could do here to get all of my dates to update and reflect accurately is go to the predecessors column, click the drop down and select task number two as the predecessor. Notice on the timeline, it automatically links those tasks together and it moves task number three into the correct position because it starts directly after the task before it. I still need to add the duration, so I need to come in here and I'm gonna say that this is gonna take one day. So my automatic tasks start and finish date has basically been determined by its predecessor and whatever duration I've entered. Now, what about if this task doesn't have a predecessor? So if I remove the predecessor from this box by selecting it and pressing the delete key, notice what happens to this task. It moves back to the start date of the project. And if I try and change the start date to, let's say the 21st of March, I'm going to get this little error message just here. And this is where we start to get into things like constraints. Now, I'm not gonna get into that at this moment in time, I just really want to illustrate the difference between manual and automatic tasks. So when we have a task set to automatic and the start date isn't defined by a predecessor, if we try and go in and manually change that start date, we're gonna get all kinds of error messages and constraints pop up. So this is where we would want to use a manually scheduled task instead. This is going to allow us to go in. We don't necessarily have to have a predecessor. We can just select the exact dates that we want from the calendar dropdown. So I want this to start on the 21st, which it does. The duration is one day, so it's going to end on the 21st as well. And if we take a look in the schedule, you can see that manually scheduled tasks show in a teal color. We have darker caps on the end and the beginning to show we have start and finish times in there that are fixed. And also notice we have this little push pin icon in the task mode dropdown. So automatic tasks are great for tasks that are linked together because it will automatically work out the start and finish times. But in some cases that can be a little bit restrictive and you might find switching it to a manually scheduled task a little bit easier to work with. Another type of task we can add into our project plan are milestone tasks. And milestones really show key points in a project. They might be there to show progress, completed deliverables, or decisions or triggers. And milestone tasks don't have any duration. So we can add as many as we need into our project. So let's add a couple in because these are very simple and straightforward. Now, notice that I've made a couple of changes to this project since the last lesson. I've added in a few more tasks, and the majority of these have predecessors and are automatically scheduled tasks. The final one at the bottom, where we finalise the course outline, you can see I have a little note in there, it's a manually scheduled task, and I don't really know the duration or the finish dates yet because I'm waiting on approval from the training manager. So I'm going to add in a milestone task for when this course outline is approved by the training manager. So I'm going to select task number six. 
And another little side note here, when you're selecting tasks, click on the task number all the way over on the left hand side. That's going to select the whole task as opposed to the individual fields if you were to click in any of these. So we're going to click on task number six. Let's go up to the task tab and all the way over in the insert group, we have a milestone option. So let's click to add a milestone task. Now notice that's inserted above where I was clicked and we just have the default text of new milestone. Now notice that the duration is zero days. As I said, milestone tasks don't have any duration, so it's always going to default to zero days. And now we can rename this milestone. So I'm going to click in the field and this is going to be outline approved. Now this milestone task relies on task number five, the task before being completed. So let's add in a predecessor. Once again, we can click the drop down, and I'm going to choose task number five, click on OK and now check out the timeline. Milestones are represented with this little diamond icon. So let's zoom in so you can see that a little bit clearer. If we scroll across, we have a little diamond icon there and it's showing me the date of this key milestone. And this milestone task doesn't change at all unless you manually move it. And milestone tasks don't increase the project duration in any way or reflect on the work or resource time. So now that I have that milestone, I can update the information for task number seven. So the duration is going to be one day, but I now know the date that this task can start. So we're going to change this to the day after the outline has been approved. So that is going to be March the 25th, but check it out. The 25th is a Saturday. So we want to set this to the next working day, which is going to be the 27th. And if we take a look at the timeline, we can see that change has now been reflected. And it's also worth noting that you can create predecessors for milestone tasks as well. So I'm going to make the milestone task, a predecessor of finalized course outline. So if we click the drop down, there it is, task number six, outline approved. Let's click, and that's now updated in the schedule. Summary tasks help us organize our project, and they also give our project structure. Summary tasks can represent different phases of a project, or even different groups of tasks. And by design, when we create a summary task, we can have subtasks of that overall summary task. So let's start out in this example by inserting some new summary tasks for existing tasks in our project. So I've added a few more tasks in here. I've set the duration, start and finish times, and if they have predecessors. You'll also see that we have a bit of a mixture of automatically scheduled and manually scheduled tasks. So if I take a look at the different tasks that I have in this project, I might want to divide these up into more manageable sections. As I said, creating summary tasks allows us to focus on just what we're interested in at any given time, and it also makes our project easier to read, easier to understand, and it gives it structure. So we're going to split this project up into a few different sections. So what I'm going to do first here is I'm going to select all of the tasks that belong to the first section. And our first section is going to be called preparation phase. So let's hover our mouse over where we have task one until we can see that little black arrow. I'm going to click and then I'm going to drag down to select all of the tasks that belong to this first phase. So that is basically going to be tasks one to seven. Let's go up to the task tab and then in the insert group, we have a summary option. And this is going to allow us to insert a summary task. Now check out what's happened to our table just here. We now have new summary task at the top and the other tasks are now effectively subtasks of this summary task. So let's give our summary task a name. We can click in the field and this is going to be called preparation phase. You don't have to put it in caps. That's just how I've chosen to lay these summary tasks out. Now notice that as soon as I do that, I get this little black triangle next to the summary task. So this is a collapsible and expandable group now. I can click on the little arrow and it's going to collapse up all of the subtasks 
click again and it's going to expand them all out. Also notice with this summary task, if we check out the timeline, summary tasks are represented by a black bar. Now the duration of the summary task is very much defined by the durations of the subtasks below it. So the summary task is basically going to show us the duration when we add up all of these subtasks below. And the start and finish dates for the summary task again is going to be determined by the subtask below. So the start date that you see up here for this summary task is going to be the start date of the earliest task in this group. And the finish date is going to be the finish date of the latest task in this group. So we don't really have to go in and edit anything for summary tasks because it's all determined by the subtask below. And the reason why these summary tasks are quite nice is because at a glance, you can see exactly how long this preparation phase is going to take. I can see it's going to take 18 days. I can see we're starting on March the 1st and the preparation phase is going to come to an end on March the 27th. So it gives you a really nice high level overview. Let's add in some more summary tasks. So this time I'm going to select tasks nine to task 17. Let's click on summary once again. This is going to be the recording phase. And this time you can see the duration for this entire phase is 69 days and we can see the start and end dates and check out how that reflects in the timeline. Let's select tasks 19 to 24. Click on summary. This is the documentation phase. And then finally, we have the go live phase. So all of the subtasks are indented under their relevant summary tasks. And we can collapse up any that we're not interested in, which helps us remove the noise and really just focus in on the tasks that are of interest to us. Now notice that when we've added in these summary tasks, by default, they are automatically scheduled summary tasks. But we can also have manually scheduled summary tasks as well. And manually scheduled summary tasks are sometimes quite good for showing us if we have enough time to get subtasks done. So I'm going to add in another summary task, and this is really just for demonstration purposes. I'm going to delete it straight away afterwards. But let's say I want to insert another summary task just here. So I'm going to highlight task 15. Let's go up to summary, and I'm just going to add in here editing phase. And I'm going to switch this to a manually scheduled summary task. Now, currently the editing phase summary task only has one subtask, which is make video amendments. And the make video amendments task ends on June the 29th. So the summary task above reflects that as well. Now check out what happens if I go into this summary task and modify the duration. I'm going to take this down to two dates. Now notice what happens here. I've got a red squiggly line underneath the finish. And if we check out the timeline, notice that it's showing in red. And that's basically telling me that the summary task is set to end before its subtask, in this case, completes. And this is probably something that I'm going to need to look at. Now, this doesn't generally tend to happen with automatically scheduled tasks, but sometimes when you're working with manually scheduled summary tasks, this problem might pop up. So it's good to know what it means and how to fix it. So now I can see that this is in red. I can say, OK, I've set two days for the editing phase, but we only have one subtask here and that is four days long. So it's going to finish after the end of the summary task. Now, I'm just going to take this back up to four, which is an easy fix. As soon as I do that, you can see that it changes back to how it was previously a teal bar with the summary task showing just above. So in the last lesson, we saw how we can add a bit of structure into our project by adding summary and subtasks. And I just want to focus a little bit more on that at the beginning of this lesson. And then I'm going to show you how you can import tasks from other Microsoft applications. Now, when we look at our tasks in our task entry view, we can see that the summary tasks are currently showing in bold with these little triangles next to them. And then all of the subtasks of these summary tasks are slightly indented from the left hand side. Now, this is effectively a first level indent. And if we click on the little triangle, as we've seen, that's going to collapse up that particular group of tasks. Click again to expand them out. 
Now, it is worth noting that we can have subtasks of subtasks. For example, if I wanted to make, let's say, task number three, draft course outline, a subtask of, of conduct course research, task number two, I can simply select task number three. And then up on the task ribbon in the schedule group, I have this little button here that will allow me to indent that task. Notice that the one next to it will outdent the task, so it's going to do the opposite. So if I click indent task, notice what happens in the grid. It's now indented task number three and made it a subtask of task number two. And in turn, because task number two is now effectively a summary task, even though it's not a top level summary task, it's highlighted in bold. And again, we have the same collapsible and expandable menu. So if I collapse this up, it's just going to collapse up that one subtask, click again to expand it out. Now, if I want to do the reverse of that, this can sometimes throw people off a little bit because most people think, OK, well, I'm going to select task number two and I'm going to use the outdent button. Now, if we do that, we get something a little bit strange. Outdenting makes task number two a top level task and it removes the top level task from preparation phase. Now, I'm going to control Z just to undo that, because effectively what we want to do here is select task number three and then click on the outdent button. And that's going to put everything back to how it was previously. So don't forget about these two little buttons up here to indent and outdent your different tasks. Another thing that's worth noting is that if we jump up to the Gantt chart format ribbon, remember this is one of those contextual ribbons that you only see when you need it. And because we're working in Gantt chart view, that's why I can see this ribbon. Now, all the way over on the right hand side, we have a little show hide group here, which is going to allow us to view as sub as summary and subtasks in different ways. So currently you can see that I'm showing summary tasks. If I was to deselect this, it's going to remove those and I just get a big long list of all of the tasks in my project. Click again to add those back in. Now, something else I can add is a project summary task. Now, when I click on this, check out what happens. We now get a new task at the top and this is always task number zero. And this project summary task shows us information for the entire project. So I always like to have this in my project. So I've got a good at a glance overview of the exact duration and the start and finish dates of the entire project. The task name is always going to be the name of the project plan that you're working on. So for me, this particular plan is called import task information. And that's why I have that in the task name just there. But of course, we can go in and change that to something a little bit more meaningful. So I'm going to say, let's just call this training rollout project. So I highly recommend you turn on that project summary task. And then finally, at the top, we can show or hide outline numbers. So this shows our summary tasks and subtasks with a different numbering system. So we have one, 1.1, 1.2, so on and so forth. If I was to make, for example, this task, if I was to indent this a little bit further, so let's indent it. It then goes to 1.2 and 1.2.1 before going back to 1.3. So that can sometimes be a really nice way of structuring your project. Now, something else we can do when it comes to adding tasks into our project is we can import them from other Microsoft applications. For example, I've got some tasks that I want to add to this project and I've got them in a Word document. Now, notice the way that I've structured this Word document. I have the summary task at the top. This is the live training phase. Then I have my top level task here. I've got some subtasks, so on and so forth throughout this document. And notice that some of these I have highlighted in yellow. And these are basically my milestone tasks. Now, if I want to quickly get all of these into my project plan, I don't have to manually type them in. I can simply copy and paste. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select everything in this document. And a quick way of doing that is to press the keyboard shortcut, Control A. I'm going to press Control C to copy. Let's go back to our project scroll all the way down to the bottom and I'm going to click in the task name and then I just need to paste control V and take a look at that. It pastes everything in with the correct summary and subheadings. 
Now I will say it doesn't always get this completely right, so I would definitely go through and check that everything is as it should be, but in general this is a much quicker way than going through and typing it all in yourself. Obviously we still need to go in and update our duration, start and finish information. And check out those milestone tasks that were highlighted in yellow in the Word document. You can see that it brings across that formatting. It doesn't make these milestone tasks automatically in project, but it is a good way to remind us that these ones need to be changed to milestone tasks. And a quick way of changing these to milestone tasks is to simply set the duration to zero. So I'm going to do that for all three of these. And they are now effectively milestones in this project. Once I've set these as milestones, I can select all three of these and in the font group, I'm going to say no color just to remove that yellow background fill. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to add some durations and some start and finish dates for these tasks that we've just added. I'll see you in the next lesson. So let's take a look at some of the things we can do to reorganize the structure of our projects. Now, as we've already seen, we can use our indent and outdent buttons on the task ribbon in order to indent or outdent various different tasks in our schedule. For example, if I scroll down my list of tasks, maybe I decide that task number 37, get budget approval, is indented too much. We can simply select it, go up to the schedule group, and I'm going to choose to outdent this task which now puts it on the same level as book venue and create venue shortlist. So very easy to rearrange the structure in that way, effectively creating summary tasks and subtasks. Now, what about when it comes to moving tasks around? Now you can move tasks around by dragging and dropping them, but in my experience, particularly if you have a long list of tasks, it can be a little bit fiddly trying to move tasks around in that way because the page tends to scroll really, really quickly. So a much easier way to move your tasks around is simply to use cut and paste. For example, maybe I decide that this section just here, the travel and accommodation section, and when I say section, I mean the summary task and all of its subtasks, maybe I want to move that so that it all happens before we sort out the venues. So what I can do here is select the summary task and all of its subtasks, which is all of these. I can then press Control X, or alternatively, if we go up to the task ribbon in the clipboard group, we have a cut option just here. So let's click on cut and notice that that planning wizard pops up again. So it's telling me that I've got multiple summary tasks selected and it says deleting them will delete all their subtasks as well. Now this is because project has recognized that I've cut them, so I'm essentially removing them from their current place in the schedule. So it sort of thinks that I'm deleting them. Now, I'm not deleting these tasks, I'm simply moving them. So I'm going to choose cancel just here and click on OK. And then I'm simply going to move to where I want to paste them, which is up here. And once again, I can press the Control V key to paste, or alternatively, I can jump up to the clipboard group and click the top half of the paste button. And like magic, that moves them all into place. So that is by far the easiest way to move individual or groups of tasks. Now, one thing you might notice is that when you start to make changes in your schedule, some of these fields or some of the cells are going to be shaded in blue. Now, what these indicate are basically just changes that we've made. So if you take a look at this, you can see that all of the fields for the travel and accommodation section are currently shaded out in this light blue color. And that's because we've just made a change to these. We've just moved them. So if you are curious as to what that blue shading means, it's really there just to be helpful to show you the last tasks that you've made changes to. It's time now to talk about deleting tasks. Because whilst this is a fairly straightforward process, there are a couple of little quirks that you need to be aware of. So let's start out nice and easy, deleting a single task. For example, if I go all the way down to the bottom of my schedule where I have printout expense forms, if I want to delete this task, all I need to do is select the task and I can simply press the delete key on my keyboard or alternatively, I can right click on the task and I have a delete task option in the contextual menu. 
So if we delete this, nice and straightforward, it's gone from the schedule. Now, I actually don't want to delete that. So let's do a control Z to undo and restore that task. Now, this works slightly different if you're deleting a summary task and its subtasks. So let's select the summary task and all of its subtasks. And if I press the delete key on my keyboard, that planning wizard is going to pop up again. So it's telling me that expenses is a summary task and deleting it will delete all of its subtasks as well. Now that makes sense in this instance because we have the summary task and all of the subtasks selected. So you would imagine that if we are pressing delete, we want to delete everything that we've selected. So here I get a choice. I can continue and delete expenses and its subtasks, or I can cancel and not delete anything. So I'm going to say continue, click on OK, and it's going to delete that entire group. Now I'm going to control Z to undo again, because if we were just to select the summary task at the top and press delete, again, it's going to ask me the same question. So I have a choice of deleting the summary task and all of its subtasks, or I can cancel and not delete anything. So the point I'm trying to make here is don't think that just because you haven't selected the subtasks, if you try and delete the summary task, that is the only option you're going to get. Now let's take a look at a slightly different scenario. Maybe we want to delete a summary task, but not any of the subtasks. So we need to go about this in a slightly different way. Now, notice that I've added just some example tasks into the schedule. So task number 60 is the summary task, and then tasks 61 to 63 are the subtasks. So if I want to delete the summary tasks, but keep the subtasks, I first need to select the subtasks and put them on the same level as the summary task. So for this, we're going to go up to the schedule group on the task ribbon and use our outdent button. That effectively makes the summary task and its subtask the same outline level. I can then simply go in and delete the summary task as normal by pressing the delete key. I can then reselect these three tasks and change their indentation level if I need to. So I'm going to outdent all of these. And the final point worth mentioning here about deleting is that if you want to delete an entire task, you need to make sure that you have the entire task selected by clicking on that task ID. If you're clicked in, let's say, the task name and you press delete, it's simply going to delete just the information from that particular field. But notice as soon as I do that, I now get this little cross icon pop up where I get an opportunity to delete the entire task. So if I click that cross, it's going to say delete the task name or delete the task. So I'm going to say delete the task to get rid of the whole thing. So just be aware of that when you're making your deletions. Now, I actually don't want these two tasks in here, so I'm going to select them, press the delete key, and we're now back to how we were originally. One thing that can be really useful in project is to create WBS codes. And WBS stands for Work Breakdown Structure. And what a WBS code is, is a unique code that helps us identify each task in our project. Now, why on earth would you need a WBS code to identify your tasks? Well, it might be that in some projects you have tasks with the same name. For example, if we look at this project on the screen, you can see task number 46 is get budget approval. And this is related to approving the budget for the venues. And then a bit further down, we also have another task, task number 55, which is also get budget approval. But this time it's related to travel and accommodation for the trainers. So effectively, these tasks have the same name. So adding a unique identifier is going to be helpful to us further down the track. So let's take a look at how we can create WBS codes and apply them to our schedule. Now, the first thing we want to do here is we want to add a column into our project plan to show our WBS codes. So don't make the mistake of thinking that the task ID is the unique identifier. This is effectively just the row number or the task number. So let's insert a WBS column. So I'm going to right click on task mode and we're going to go to insert column. And this is where we can choose the type of column that we're inserting. 
So I'm going to scroll all the way down because these are in alphabetical order and we should have one for WBS and there it is. Now notice as soon as I add this column, it's giving me its default WBS numbering. Now we can create our own custom numbering to make this a little bit more relevant to the project that we're working on. So let's take a look at how we would do that. So to create our own WBS codes, we need to jump up to the project ribbon. And in the properties group, we have a WBS option. If we click the drop down, we can go to define code. And this is where we can create our own work breakdown structure codes. Now, the first thing we can do here is we can add in a project code prefix. So in order to uniquely identify this project, I could give it a prefix of let's say TRP for training rollout project. And I'm going to put a dash there because I want a dash to separate that project code prefix and any numbering that I go with after this. So now in this code mask area, we can define the numbering sequence that we want to use for our unique codes. And this first one is the top level. So if we click the drop down just here, we can choose what we want it to display. So I'm going to say numbers. And you'll see as I select these, we get a code preview at the top. So if I was to click on OK just here, my tasks are going to be numbered TRP1, TRP2, TRP3, so on and so forth. In the length column, I can place a limit on the number of characters. So if I was to select two just here, it means the numbers are going to run from zero to 99. And I'm going to leave my separator as a period. Now I'm going to add another level. And this time I'm going to choose lowercase letters. And once again, I'm going to select two characters. And again, you can see in the code preview exactly what this is going to look like. So this part of the code is going to run through from A to ZZ. Let's add another level. So I'm going to say uppercase. This time I'm going to make the length three. Our fourth level is going to be numbers and I'm going to set this to two and let's add a fifth level as well. That's also going to be numbers and I'm going to leave that on any length. So now we've defined what our code is going to look like. We want to make sure that we keep these two checkboxes underneath selected because it means it's going to generate a new unique WBS code for any new tasks that I add into the project. And it's also going to keep checking that the WBS codes that are being added are unique. So let's keep those checked. Click on OK. And now you can see if we widen out this WBS column exactly what our numbering structure looks like. So let's take a look at our summary tasks that we have here. Those have TRP01, TRP02, TRP03, so on and so forth. The next level down is 01AA, 01AB, 01AC, so on and so forth. And that pattern continues throughout our project plan. Notice as we get a bit further down in this project plan where we have more outline levels, we can see our WBS code is using more of the code that we specified. So for example, task number 31 is TRP05AA and then we have triple A. The next one goes to double AB, double AC, so on and so forth. So WBS codes are a great way to create a custom code that helps you uniquely identify tasks in your project plan. In this exercise, we're going to practice some of the skills that we've learned in this section of the course. So the first thing I'd like you to do is to open the file new underscore business underscore plan dot XLSX from the exercise files folder. And this is an Excel file. And we're going to use this file as the basis for the project that we're going to create throughout the balance of these exercises. Once you have that open, I'd then like you to go back to project and create a new blank project and save it as your initials business plan dot MPP. And I'd like you to set the start date of the project to the 7th of November 2024, or if you're using your own project, whatever the start date of your project is. Once you've done that, I'd like you to add the first four tasks in the spreadsheet, the ones that aren't in bold because those are summary tasks, into the project as automatically scheduled tasks. 
Now you don't necessarily have to add them all. There is a lot of them in the spreadsheet, but add a good 10, 15 to 20. I then like you to mark some of the tasks as milestone tasks in the schedule. Now, again, I have a few tasks in the spreadsheet marked as milestones, but if you haven't added that many tasks, you can set any of the tasks to milestones. And then once you've done that, I'd like you to go through and create summary and subtasks, again, using the spreadsheet as a guide. And if you'd like to see my answer, then please keep watching. So I've opened up the new business plan Excel file and I've got it positioned on the right hand side of my screen. And in the left hand side, I just have project open. So the first thing we need to do here is open up a new blank project and we need to save this. So let's go up to file down to save as I'm going to browse and select a location. And we're going to call this our initials new business plan and click on save. The next thing I asked you to do was to change the project start date. So if we look at the details in the spreadsheet, the first task basically starts on November the 7th, 2024. So I'm going to use that as my project start date. So I'm going to jump into project information and I'm going to set the start date from here. Now, because this is quite far in the future and I don't want to have to scroll through a calendar, I'm just simply going to type this in. So November the 7th, 2024 and click on OK. And you can see it jumps to that part of the schedule. So now that we have everything set up, we can start to add in the tasks. And I'm just going to add the first one. I asked you to add the first four for a little bit of practice. So the first one we want to add, which isn't a summary task, is self-assessment. So let's move across to task name. Now notice here it's put it in as a manually scheduled task. So I'm going to go down to the bottom and make sure that I have auto scheduled selected. And then we're going to change this to auto scheduled. Now the start date of this task is in fact November the 7th which is when the project starts, the duration according to the spreadsheet is three days. And there we go. We have our first task scheduled and we can see the blue bar update. Let's add the next one. Define business vision. This is a one day task. And again, this starts on November the 7th. So we simply carry on going through adding in these different tasks. And this is really all the information that I want you to add at this stage. So I've added in a few more of those tasks. And the next thing I asked you to do was to mark some milestones in the schedule. So if we take a look at the spreadsheet in column A, we have milestone. So I can see the first milestone is this one down here, confirm decision to proceed, which in the spreadsheet is in row 27. So if we scroll down to task 27, this is going to be a little bit out because we don't have the summary tasks in here, but it should give us the rough area where this is. So there it is just there, confirm decision to proceed. I'm going to mark this as a milestone. Let's double click to open it up and I'm going to select mark task as milestone and click on OK. And I would go through this spreadsheet marking the other tasks that we can see in here are milestones in the schedule. The final thing I asked you to do in this exercise was to create this summary and the sub tasks. So again, I'm just going to do the first one because once you've done one, you can pretty much do them all. So the first one at the top here in row two of the spreadsheet, new business, this is our top level task. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to right click and I'm going to insert a task at the top there. Let's double click to open it up and we're going to call this new business and click on OK. And this is basically going to be our top level summary task. So we need to select everything else in the spreadsheet. So from task two, control shift down arrow all the way down to task 101. And I'm going to have to maximize my window so I can see this properly. If we go to task in the schedule group, I'm going to indent these tasks, which effectively makes that top task the top level summary task. I'm then going to right click and insert another task. And this one is going to be phase one strategic plan and click on OK. Now, this is going to be a summary task as well, because if we refer back to our spreadsheet, you can see define the opportunity is also a summary task. So I just want to include these tasks within the phase one strategic plan summary task. 
So let's select those tasks. And once again, we're going to click indent task. And now you can see our structure beginning to take shape. So what I would like you to do is just go through the rest of your tasks, adding in this structure and use the spreadsheet as your guide. In order for a project to work and flow correctly, project tasks need to be performed in the right sequence. And when it comes to a project plan, task dependencies or links basically define the sequence of the tasks. And it's worth noting that most links have a link type of finish to start. So what exactly does that mean, this finish to start? Well, let's take a look at our current schedule. So if we scroll to, let's say, these tasks just here, and I'm going to zoom out a little bit because that is a little bit too wide. Now, if we take a look at these tasks, so task 11 down to about task 15, notice that we have little arrows linking these tasks together. So effectively, what these links denote is that task number 12 isn't going to start until task number 11 has finished. So that is what we call a finish to start link. And you'll find that the majority of links that you come across in project are going to be finished to start. One task finishes before the next task can begin. So effectively, what we have here is task number 11 is a predecessor of task number 12. So how do we create links between two tasks? Well, let's scroll down a bit further in the schedule. And I'm going to say here that task number 32 assign teams to regions can't be completed until we've assigned trainers to teams because each trainer has a specific preference as to which region they'd like to travel to. So we need to establish that first before we assign the teams to the regions. Now I have task number 32 highlighted and if you take a look at the timeline view or where we normally have our bars, I've got nothing on the screen. I'm not in the correct position in the schedule. Now a quick way to jump to the part of the bars that relates to the task that you're currently clicked on is to simply go up to the task tab and all the way over in the editing group, we have a scroll to task button. Now, if I click this, it's going to move me to the place in the schedule relevant to where I'm clicked in the task entry table. Now, you'll find yourself using this scroll to task button all the time. So while I'm here, I'm going to right click and I'm going to add it to my quick access toolbar to make it super easy for me to access. So I can see here that task number 32 is a manually scheduled task and I need to link it to task number 31. So for this, we need to select the task we want to link to first and then the other task. So I'm going to hold down control and select both of these. Then up on the task ribbon in the schedule group, I'm going to click this little link chain icon. And notice here that there is a keyboard shortcut to quickly link tasks of control F2. Now, when I click this, notice what happens to the bars. It inserts a link. So now we have this little arrow that links these two tasks. But if we also check out what we have in the predecessors column in the entry table, you can see that it's automatically added that task number 31 is a predecessor of task number 32. Now, when we're working through our schedule and we're creating lots of different links and dependencies, it can sometimes be quite useful to see a little bit more information about those links. So what we can do is go up to the view ribbon and in split view, I'm going to select details. And this opens up another window at the bottom called the task form. And what this is going to show me is additional information about whatever task I'm currently clicked on in the task entry view. So if we take this linked task, for example, if I click on task number 32, I can see some further information. I can see the name of the task, the duration, the fact that it's manually scheduled, the percentage complete. And if I take a look over on the right hand side, I can see the task that it's linked to. So it's linked to task ID 31, assign trainers to teams. And it's telling me that the task type is FS, which basically means finish to start. Now, it's also worth noting when you're working with links that you don't necessarily just have to link each task to the previous task individually. You can do them all in one go. For example, I could select um, these three tasks just here, go up to the task ribbon and click on create link. And it's automatically going to create finish to start links for all of these tasks. 
So that can be really helpful if you have tasks in your project that can only start when the previous task finishes. Now, aside from clicking on the little chain link icon in the schedule group to link tasks together, you can also link in a couple of other ways. For example, if I wanted to link tasks two and three together, I can simply come over to the predecessors column and I can either type the task number, in this case, number two, or alternatively, if I delete that out, I can click the drop down arrow. It's going to pull up a big long list of all of the tasks and I can select the task that I want to link to from here. So again, that would be number two. So three different methods that you can use in order to link your tasks. Now I'm going to remove that because I don't want to link those two. Notice as I did that, as I added that link, check out the cells that are showing as being changed. The dates for all of the tasks below changed because of that link I just created. And that is why these are showing as changed cells. Now we do have other task types that we can add in. As I said, by far, finish to start is the most common. But we also have finish to finish links that we can add, where the finish of one controls the finish of another. And then we have the two rarest task types, start to start and start to finish. And those really aren't used very often. And I will say that something like start to start can be quite problematic. If the predecessor task starts and then is delayed, it could finish after the successor. And start to finish means that the start of one task triggers the finish of the other. As I said, both of those are extremely rare. Now, if you want to change the type of link that a task has, again, we need to make sure that we have our details pane open. And if we select, let's say this task on the right hand side in the task form where we can see the predecessor, we can also see the type. So this is a finish to start, but we can come in here and change this to a finish to finish. We can change it to a start to finish or we can change it to a start to start. And this subject is definitely something I recommend reading the help files on so you get a really good idea as to the types of scenarios, the types of tasks where you might have to use a different link type. And if we take a quick look in the help files, you can see here underneath types of tasks, we have those different link types and a full description. And in this description, it gives you different scenarios where these might come up. So I definitely recommend having a read through so that you know if and when you need to apply those to your project plan. I'm going to switch off the details pane and we are about ready to move on to the next lesson. Sometimes when we're working with our project, there is a delay or an overlap between tasks. And this is where we can add in lag or lead time. So let's take a look at a quick example. Now, currently in this schedule, if we take a look at task number five, and I'm going to make sure that I'm on the correct part of the timeline and we can see that task number five is basically to update the course outline. Now, in order to update the course outline, I need to receive feedback from the training team. And the task before that is to send the outline to the training team for review. Now, currently I've assigned a one day duration to that. Now, it might be that the training team are assigned to another project for the next four days and can't actually look at this outline. So what I could do is I could add in some lag time and reflect that in the timeline. So if you take a look at the bars currently, we can see that update course outline is linked to the task before and currently update course outline is set to start as soon as the previous task finishes. So as soon as the training team have reviewed the outline, I can then update the course outline based off of their feedback. But now they're not available for the next four days. So nothing's going to happen for four days and I need to reflect that in my project plan. So what I can do here is once again, let's jump up to view and open up the details pane because in here, this is where we can apply lag time. If you take a look at the right hand side, we can see the predecessor of this particular task is task number four. The type is finished to start and currently the lag time is zero days. But check out what happens if I change this to four. So I'm going to use the little arrows just to move up to four. And when I click away, the schedule is going to update. Now you might need to scroll in a little bit just to see that, but check out what we have now. 
If we click on task number four, we can see the duration where it's supposed to start, but then we have four days of lag time before the next task starts. And if you check out what we now have in the predecessors column, we can see that for task number five, update course outline, I can see that this is linked to task number four with a finish to start link type, and it has plus four days lag. That's what this little code means just here. So this is particularly useful because it enables you to see at a glance so much information. So wherever you have a delay in your schedule, you can reflect that accurately by simply adding in lag time to your tasks. Now, what about if we want to do the complete opposite of that? Maybe we want to add overlap time to our schedule. Now, what do I mean by overlap time? Well, it might be that we have two tasks that can overlap each other. For example, if we take a look at the recording phase in my project plan, maybe I don't need to finish writing all of my training notes before I start recording the training videos. So what I could do here is I could add in overlap time. Now, the way that we do this is pretty much exactly the same as when we add in lag time, but we just use minus values instead. So I'm going to select record training videos, task number 11. We can see that in our timeline if I scroll over a little bit. And if we take a look in the task form, we can see that this is linked to task number 10, write training notes. It has a finish to start link type, and currently there is no lag or overlap. Now we're going to change that. We're going to click in this cell, and instead of using the up arrow to make it a positive value, we're going to say that there is a five day overlap just here. So it goes to minus five when I click, check out how that updates in the schedule. If we take a look at our bars, we can see that task number 11, record training videos, can start whilst write training notes is still going on. And we have the arrow here linking these tasks, but we clearly have an overlap. Once again, if we take a look in the predecessors column, we can see exactly what's happening here. We can see that task number 11 is linked to task number 10 with a finish to start link type, and we have an overlap of minus five days. So that is the difference between lag and lead time. Use them accordingly wherever you feel they're necessary in your schedule. Sometimes tasks in our project need to occur on specific dates or have restrictions. And constraints are one way to specify when a task starts and finishes. And it's worth noting that every task has a date constraint. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's switch into a different view so you understand what I'm talking about. Now, currently I have task form open at the bottom, but we're going to jump up to the view tab and over in split view, we're going to click the drop down and go straight into more views. Because what I want to bring up here is the task details form. Let's click on apply and I can now see that showing in the pane at the bottom. Now this is going to show me what constraints are applied to any particular task I have selected in the task entry table. So let's just pick a random task here, task number six. We can see a lot of information about this task, but we can see that there is a constraint on this task. Now, I haven't set any constraints manually myself on any tasks that we've added into this schedule. I've just typed them in. We've done a couple of other things, but we haven't specified specifically constraints for any of the tasks. But there is a default constraint that's applied to all tasks. And you can see here that that constraint is that the task starts as soon as possible. And that's kind of really what you want when project is trying to work out your durations and your timings. It works off of the principle that you really want this project to be finished as soon as it's possible. And that is why we have that constraint type applied to every single task. Now, of course, if we click the drop down here, we have other constraint types that we can use. So things like as late as possible, finish no earlier than, finish no later than, must finish on, must start on, so on and so forth. And there might be scenarios where you need to add one of these constraints, depending on what's going on in your project. So let's take a look at a quick example. Now, if we take a look at this task, task number 58, I can see that this is due to start on September the 12th, 2023. And maybe I know that at the end of September every single year, there is a sale on flights. 
So I don't want anybody to start booking flights for the trainers until those flights go on sale because we're going to save the company quite a bit of money. So what I can do here is I can change the constraint from start as soon as possible to start no earlier than and then I can select a date. So I'm going to go across to September 2023 and I don't want anyone to start booking flights until the last week of September. So let's change that to the 25th and you can see automatically the schedule updates and everything below that relies on this particular task has also updated, hence why we have those blue cells. Now I'm going to scroll to task by using the icon on the quick access toolbar so I can see what we have going on here. Now notice something else about this task. Now that we've added that constraint, you can see that in the information column on the left hand side, we now have this little calendar icon. And if I hover my mouse over it, I get a little screen tip pop up that says this task has a start no earlier than constraint on September the 25th, 2023. So whenever you see that calendar in that column, it means that there's a constraint applied to that particular task. Now I'm going to leave it to you to explore some of these other constraint types. I think most of them are pretty self-explanatory. Now a lot of these are what we would consider to be flexible constraint types but some of them are a little bit more fixed. So for example, must start on. For example, if I select task number 47, book venue, maybe that's a very fixed item and it must start on a specific date in order for anything that comes after it to flow correctly through the project. So maybe we have to book a venue on August the 25th. So I could select a constraint in here to make that more fixed in the schedule. So I'm going to select it. It is a milestone task. We can still apply constraints to milestones, but I'm going to change the constraint to must start on and then I can choose the date. So it's going to be August the 25th. So let's jump across to August and select the 25th. Click on OK. And once again, we get that little calendar icon which says that this task has a must start on constraint and then we have the date. So some of these are a little bit more flexible, some of them are very fixed, but something that's worth bearing in mind is that you want to really limit the number of date constraints that you have in your project. And the reason why you want to limit it is because it reduces project's ability to schedule things in the best way. If we're constantly adding constraints into the project, must start on this date, can't start before that date, project is going to find it harder to create a project plan that flows nicely through. Now, obviously, in some circumstances, you're going to need to add constraints. But all I'm saying is be mindful of how many you have in your project and try and limit them the best that you can. Another thing that's worth noting about task constraints is that you don't necessarily have to apply these from the task details form. So if you don't have this details pane open, and your project looks something like this, what you can do is select your task and then on the task ribbon, all the way over in the properties group, we have an information button. And that's gonna pull up loads of information about the task that you've selected. So in this case, I've selected a summary task. Now if we jump across to the advanced tab, we can also set our constraint type in here. So this one currently is as soon as possible, but if we click the drop down, we have some other options and we can choose a constraint date. Now notice here that when I click the drop down, I only have three options to choose from. Now that's because I'm clicked on a summary task. If I just click on a regular work task, go up to information and to the advanced tab, when I click the drop down, I now have all of those constraint types. So if you see a shorter list in here, it's gonna be because you're clicked on a summary task as opposed to a work task. And this information box is a really good place to come because this is where you're going to find lots and lots of information about the tasks that you currently have selected in the schedule. And of course, you can modify task information from here as well, as well as from the task form details pane. When we start linking tasks together in project, it can start to become a little bit cluttered. 
So we need to know the best ways that we can view our tasks and view predecessors and links. Now, one way we've already seen, we have the predecessors column in our task entry table, which gives us a nice overview. We can see immediately which tasks are linked to other tasks and also the type of task link that we have in place and if there's any lead or lag time. So if you don't have this predecessors column showing, I highly recommend that you right click, go to insert column and choose predecessors from here. And remember this long list is in alphabetical order. So it's very simple to find the one that you need. Now I already have my predecessors column, so I'm just going to escape out of that. Now, another way that we can view our tasks and any links is by looking at the bars on the right hand side. Now, currently I'm not seeing a great deal on this page because I have my bar set to display every single day. So my tasks are very stretched out across the entire timeline of the project, which in some cases is a good thing if you want to see in more detail, but I actually want to condense this up a little bit so I can actually see more of the task in this area. So what we can do here is we can jump across to the view ribbon and then notice in the zoom group, we have a time scale option. And currently mine is set to days, which is why I have such a broad time scale up here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click the drop down and I'm going to change this to display in weeks. And now I can see a lot more information because it's a little bit more condensed. Another thing that we can do is we can select a task in our task entry table. So I'm just going to go for task number three and we can see it's driving predecessors. Now, if we jump up to the Gantt chart format tab in bar styles and click task path, let's take a look at the screen tip just here. It says that this is going to highlight the predecessors that directly affect the selected task. So let's click on this. Now notice when I click away, these bars change to this orange color. And depending on which task I select in the task entry table, the predecessors that are driving this particular task are going to highlight in orange. If I was to click somewhere down here, you can see more and more things get highlighted in orange. So this is a quick way of seeing all of the tasks prior to the one that you have selected that are really driving the completion of the task you currently have highlighted. And that can sometimes be really useful. Now, if you want to turn that off, just go back up to task path and deselect driving predecessors. And one final thing that you can do from this Gantt chart format tab is you can control the layout of these tasks and how they're linked together. So if we go to the format group right at the beginning here, we have a layout option and it says format various aspects of the current view. So if we click on this and take a look at the link section, we have three choices here. So I can choose to display my links like that. So I have no arrows in between each of the bars. So it gives it a less cluttered look and feel. But for me personally, I don't find this particularly helpful. I like to have a visual representation of which tasks are linked together, as opposed to just having the numbers in the predecessors column in the task entry table. But that option is there if you like that look. If I select the second one, it links them through like that. And the third one, we get something slightly different. So really it's just the format, the layout of these links. So choose whichever one you prefer. And another thing that you could turn on to make the readability of your bars a little bit easier is you could turn on grid lines. So again, in this format tab, if we click the drop down next to grid lines and select grid lines again, I'm going to choose to add lines to my Gantt rows. I can then choose the type of line. So let's go for a dotted line and I can also choose the color. So let's go for a green color and I can then choose the interval. Now I'm going to set that to none and click on OK and you can see what that looks like. So sometimes that can really aid your readability because it makes it a little bit easier to see which bar relates to which entry in the task entry table. So if you like that, then turn that on. I'm going to turn this off and try and keep this as clean as possible by setting this back to none. In this exercise, exercise five, I'd like you to create task dependencies as per the information in the spreadsheet. So you'll see that there is a 
predecessor's column that tells you which tasks need to be linked together. And then I'd like you to just have a play around adding lag and lead time into certain tasks. And I don't really mind which tasks you use for this. Once you've done that, I'd just like you to practice filtering your task list. So a good one to show would be all of the tasks in your project that are milestone tasks. So a reasonably straightforward exercise. If you'd like to see my answer, then please keep watching. So let's take a look at the spreadsheet and you can see that we have a predecessors column just here. So once again, I'm just going to do the first couple so you can see how this works. But I can see that identify available skills, information and support is dependent on the task before. So if we go to this task in the schedule, which is task ID five and expand the column, we can choose our predecessor. So this is going to be task number four, which we can simply select just here and click away. And the next task, so this one is going to be linked to task number five. And that is how simple it is to add predecessors into our schedule. Notice the arrows connecting the bars in the Gantt chart. Remember, you can add more than one predecessor to a task. So go through that spreadsheet, adding in your predecessors and creating those links. The next thing I asked you to do was to add in some lag or lead time. So let's choose this task, task number six. I'm going to double click to open it up. We're going to jump to the predecessors tab and I can see here that we have a finish to start link type currently with zero days lag. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in five days lag. Remember, if you want to add in lead time, this is going to be a minus figure in here. Let's click on OK. And now you can see how that's affected the schedule. Task number six has now been pushed by five days into the future because we've added in that lag time. If we select the previous task and for this one, let's add in three days of lead time. And the final thing I asked you to do here was just to practice playing around with some of the filters. So we can find those up on the view tab in the filters group. And one example I gave you was to filter and show all of the milestone tasks. So you can see here, I've got four of them in my schedule. If you're not a subscriber, click down below to subscribe so you get notified about similar videos we upload. To get the course exercise files and follow along with this video, click over there. And click over there to watch more videos on YouTube from Simon Says It.